Hello and welcome to our special coverage here from B20 Summit in the capital. I'm Shireen Bhan and it is my pleasure to welcome on the program the global CEO of Adobe, Shantanu Narayan. Shantanu, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here in India. Uh, you know, what a week it's been. We've landed on the moon quite literally. We've had an 18-year-old chess prodigy almost make it, but a long distance to go. Uh, global CEOs and trade ministers gathered here at the B20. What's the big message that you take away from the summit so far? Well, clearly the future is bright, Shireen, but a highlight for me is always being on your show. So thank <laughs> you for having me. It's good to have me. you back. Uh, it's, I think the excitement is just palpable. Uh, and for us, I think we always look at it from digital and AI. That's the panel that I was on. And, you know, the amazing advancements that technology has done uh, to, you know, spur the economy, everything from investment in payment schemes to a digital infrastructure to mobile devices. And, you know, we're biased, but we think that technology is uh, in many ways such an enabler uh, for societal improvement. And so I think, you know, I have been actually struck by how much in each of the groups, when they talked about the B20 groups, how much they emphasize the importance of technology. That was really nice to no, see. No, and I will talk about technology in a second, but uh, let me dive down into India and Adobe's plans for India. I mean, you've been a long-term committed investor. What, 25 years now in India? You've just That's opened right. a new facility in Bangalore. Take me through where, where plans specifically for Adobe are in light of the many changes that you're seeing and the opportunities, more importantly, that you're focusing on. Well, we've been extremely excited always about, you know, the incredible talent that exists in this country. And so when I used to come here, it was always about talent and how do we attract and retain talent. Uh, I think there are two things that have changed, uh, I think, in the economy that are equally exciting for us. The opportunity to enable businesses, their digital transformation. As you know, we have a business that targets the chief revenue officer, the chief digital officer, yeah. the chief marketing officer. And, you know, companies like Air India or financial services institutions like ICICI or HDFC mm. or retail institutions, I think the way they are using technology to engage with customers, so the business opportunity associated with Adobe in India has also exploded. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about what we can develop here, but it's also about selling. And I would say the third part that actually has been exciting is we've built some fundamental technology mm -hmm. platforms. Uh, we have one called the Adobe Experience Platform right. that allows people to store their profiles and then people can engage with customers or support these customers or do commerce with the customers. So I think the startup ecosystem mm -hmm and how we can also engage with the startup ecosystem uh, to build solutions on top of Adobe. So, uh, you know, it's no longer a one-trick pony. There's so many uh, facets of the growth here. No, it's certainly not a one-trick pony. So let me pick up on the market opportunities that you spoke of. And given the fact that this is today uh, the fastest, one of the fastest large uh, economies in the world, uh, what could that mean in terms of revenue potential? I mean, how much do you think India is going to be able to contribute to revenue for Adobe globally over the next few years? Well, when we think about Adobe uh, in uh, totality, we have over a hundred billion dollar addressable market opportunity. And certainly, you know, the business in India today is not uh, mm -hmm. where we want it to be, but the growth is tremendous. And so when we think about the growth opportunity, we don't break up by country, you know, because... I, I uh, know, but I was still trying to get a flavor of what it could potentially mean. Uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't be in the billions of dollars over time. I mean, when you look at the uh, economy, when you look at the businesses, you know, I was uh, talking to Bajaj Financial Services, mm -hmm. and you look at the growth that they're having. So, I mean, uh, you know, for all of these Indian companies, the world is their oyster. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have a multi-billion dollar digital marketing business. So there's no reason why India shouldn't be one of the major uh, regions for that. Let's now talk about technology. And, you know, it, the, the themes here continue to be around the digital transition that we're seeing, how India is poised within that. And, of course, what AI is potentially going to do. Yep. Now, how do you see AI? There is plenty of euphoria. There's also the call for guardrails to be put in place. Where are we in that transformative phase of AI as of today? If you think about the amount of attention globally that the entire computer industry is placing on AI, that's why I think you're seeing these transformative leaps. And I've been in this business for a long time. 
I really haven't seen the kind of progress in any other field like I'm seeing in AI. Uh, for us, uh, it first starts with creativity. You know, people fear the blank screen mm. when you want to create a movie production or when you want to write a report. And so I think the ability for AI to enable this creative expression mm. to really explore, because every K through 12 student or the largest enterprise in the world has ideas. And if we can help them bring those ideas to life with mm. AI, because generative AI in particular, yeah. which yeah. is all the buzz, really enables you to start to describe what you want to create. Mm. And the computer takes care of it for you. And you know, we've always been about how do we make the task at hand you know, get more and more invisible so you can focus on the output. So I think generative AI and creativity, when you actually look at the traffic for this new product that we created called Firefly, Firefly yeah. the traffic in India is tremendous. And I think it just represents the innate interest, you know, whether you're a K through 12 student or whether you're one of these largest mm. SI companies, you're doing content automation, content production, mm. content localization, content personalization. And so I think the reduction of a lot of these mundane tasks is going to change. Mm. And, you know, I think creative is going to be both at the front end of that process, allow that creative expression to really explode, and at the back end of that process, mm. which is the automation and the production mm. and the distribution and the personalization to really happen. So from a business opportunity, uh, we, think it's uh, we think it's incredibly uh, exciting. You know, you talked about Firefly, and that is your sort of answer uh, to this generative AI space that we are currently talking about. But what about monetization? And, and how long before we actually start to see it delivering on its true monetization potential? When we think about AI, uh, and when we think about Adobe in aggregate, we've always said, how do we get more people to our platform? And, you know, it's not just about the creative professionals at the top of the pyramid. It's the halo effect of that with communicators and then with consumers. Uh, so we've always been a company uh, when you think about PDF and the number of people who use it. So the way we would talk about monetizing it first, we are going to have with Firefly as well as with Adobe Express, mm. which just recently launched. It's a brand new version of people using a web-based browser to create content. We will have a freemium model. So you can come in, you can yeah. trial it out, you can perhaps use a certain number of generations. Mm. And then for all of the products that we have, I mean, I think what's really taken the world by storm is this feature called generative fill in Photoshop, mm. where within a Photoshop composition, you can suddenly say, I just want to change a layer within Photoshop. So I think the value for our creative professionals, mm. both in terms of enabling more people to the platform as well as retention, mm. because now they're getting more value for it. And then I think credit packs, and what we mean by credit packs is the ability for people to say, as I want to use more and more generations, yeah. I'm going to uh, you know, be willing to pay for it. So I think we have a multi-faceted uh, mm. approach for monetization. But right now, the excitement is about getting people to the platform, yeah. building the absolutely best foundation models. Adobe decided we have to have our imaging model. We will have our vector model. We will have our video model. And then the interfaces, which is what individuals like you and me use yeah. to create this, how do we embed it in that? You know, as we talk about the excitement and as we talk about this next wave of transformation, how critical is size going to be? There is, of course, capability, and that's a big part of it. But how critical is size going to be? You're uh, in the process of finishing off, of course, Basis uh, pending regulatory approvals, uh, your largest acquisition at $20 billion, and you're no stranger to acquisitions. But how important is in organic growth going to be and size? Well, I think, you know, uh, first, going back to the AI, uh, an absolutely important part of AI is data, right? And how do you have data? Because at the end of the day, the AI is only good as the training. Mm. And so size is important in that when we have tens of millions of people using our product or billions of assets being created, that is input into our technology. And you know, the self-reinforcing loop to make our products better, size is important there. I think in terms of, uh, you talked about talent earlier, I think it's gonna be less now about numbers of people mm. because the skill set is different. You know, from getting computer science folks who are writing programs to model builders. Yeah. So I think you're gonna see a shift in India 
where the skill set has to change from people, you know, uh, having computer science background exclusively to having computer science as well as AI model building capabilities. Mm. And I think in terms of distribution, which is the third aspect of size, mm. right? I mean, certainly we get credibility uh, in enterprises because we use our own technology. Uh, you know, we eat our own dog food or sip your own champagne, whatever term that you want. But I think in that aspect, you know, the credibility that we get from saying, if we are using that data, when we do Adobe Digital mm. Index, to get that insight available and commoditized and democratized, I think that is an opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. You know, you talked about startups and wanting to collaborate uh, with startups here in India, and, and that potentially being an opportunity that you would look at. What's exciting in that space for you specifically? Is there anything that you're looking at today? Well, you know, we're looking at it more in terms of how do they build products on our platforms. And I'll, I'll give you two examples. First, Firefly. You know, uh, with Firefly, we're going to have custom models. If you're CNBC or if you're Disney or if you're Coke, mm. you want to make sure that all of the assets that you have, you know, whether it was all the movies that you've produced or all the content that you've created is exclusively for your use. And so I think in terms of, you know, how we are thinking about using these models, we have these custom models for companies such as yourself. Mm. Uh, in terms of the startups, they are then going to use these as APIs mm. to embed. Maybe there's a medical imaging application that needs the ability to generate images. Maybe there's a automation of inefficient paper-based processes. Mm. So I think the startups are less about are we looking to acquire right mm. now and are we looking instead to you know, ensure that we have more distribution of our technology. You know, while there's plenty of excitement around the many changes that we're seeing in technology, we're also dealing with global headwinds. Uh, the global economy continues to be fairly uncertain. Of course, the Indian economy is doing far better in comparison. But how would you read that into decision making when it comes to spending, especially, uh, you know, on, on things like technology? Because we've gone through that phase of in January, everything looked great. And then we a quarter later, not so much. And it seems to have sort of uh, moved back into a con some sort of a confidence uh, uh, zone at this point in time. You know, I, I always say, hey, I'm not an economist, so I don't try and predict the future. I rather plan for the upside and react to the downside. But if you look at the sentiment in the U.S., actually, you know, sort of the doom and gloom scenario uh, economists are, I think, less in vogue right now. And I think people feel like the consumer resilience, the confidence that exists, I think is going to drive it. Irrespective of what happens in the economy, the reality is that digital is going to be an infrastructure. So, yes, we may have some business cycles, but uh, these kinds of technology uh, transformations or tectonic shifts are only going to be uh, significant tailwinds and not headwinds. You know, speaking of the regulatory architecture that everyone's talking about, what's your thought on what needs to be regulated, how it should be regulated, and who should regulate it? I, it's, it's a great question, and it's one that we, as a public and private uh, cooperation, have to figure out. The first thing I will tell you is that this is moving so fast that if we prematurely regulate it, it can actually impact the competitiveness of countries. Mm. It certainly can impact the competitiveness of, uh, you know, businesses. And so I believe that from the Adobe perspective, we look at it and say, are we ensuring that one of our core purposes, which is technology to transform, are we thinking about the unintended consequences mm. and how are we in a responsible way dealing with them? The content authenticity initiative yeah. that we have is a great example of that. We have hundreds of uh, companies that have now signed up to say, when you create a piece of content, yeah. let's make sure that we have content credentials. And that's going to be even more critical in an AI world. It's absolutely, because then you want to know, was that generated by a human? Was that generated by a machine? But I feel like premature regulation right now can only impede progress. Mm. And so I think it's incumbent to have an open conversation. You know, some of the conversations that happened in the US was like, let's create a moratorium. And mm. I'm not a fan of that because- And it, what purpose would a moratorium it, it, serve? I mean, a six month moratorium won't really do very much, will it? You're absolutely right. And it's not like everybody is going to listen to that moratorium. So if you're a company or if you're a country that's ahead, you want to, you know, further advance uh, your uh, priorities. So I don't think a moratorium will uh, do it. 
I think even when people talk about social, mm. you know, which is the thing that they all point to in terms yeah. of here is why we need regulation. Let's not underestimate also, you know, all the massive benefits that social has brought to society. So I, I think uh, industry will act in a responsible way. Uh, I would be apprehensive about each country creating a different form of regulation because then that will prevent, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of the global societal improvements that can happen with AI. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, we have to self-regulate and speaking for myself at Adobe, we're very comfortable with that. Is that a fear, though, that we are now going to see countries take a position as far as regulating AI is concerned? We've seen it with data and data protection and privacy laws. And what could that then mean as far as industry and business is concerned? Well, when they've happened, first, we've adhered to them, right? I think the big one that everybody talks about is, you know, GDPR. Right. And when GDPR came about, how do you make sure? The way we think about it is, are you being completely transparent with a customer about what data you're collecting? Are you ensuring that it's saved and stored in a secure way? And are you being transparent of how you would use that data? And I think those are core principles that continue to drive us as a company. Mm. And I think it's, you know, core principles like that, that people, if they can agree to, that will probably further the industry quicker than trying to have regulation that everybody's trying to interpret. You know, Shantanu, speaking of core principles, I want to talk to you and get you to look at the rearview mirror. Uh, you know, what a phenomenal innings it's been for you. 15 years at the helm of Adobe, 25 years altogether. What have been the big takeaways? You know, if, if, you're, if there are young entrepreneurs watching, founders watching, CEOs watching, what have been the big lessons, the realizations that you've learned uh, as CEO over the last 15 years? Well, Shireen, first, it's been the journey of a lifetime. Uh, and as you know, unfortunately, we lost one of our co-founders earlier this week. Uh, and, you know, the privilege to have worked with Adobe, which has transformed forms of written communication as we know it in the world, uh, you know, has been uh, an absolute blessing for me. I, I think, you know, people do their best work when they resonate with the mission of a company and they like the values of the company. And I'm a kid in a candy store. When I see technology, Still, I am. 25 years I on. Am, I am, and I don't know what else I would do. So I, I love building products. I love seeing the impact that people have. And I love working with people. I get my energy from people. The pandemic was probably the hardest part for me because you know, you're not with people in a mm. room brainstorming. Mm. And so I think the message, if there is one is, do something that you love and then it doesn't feel like a job. Yeah, but still, you know, to, to have the enthusiasm, the curiosity, the passion, the perseverance and, and to put that into work every day. I get that question a lot because I've been here 23 years as well. But I, and I, I'm really trying to understand how it works for different people. So, you know, what, what is it that keeps you going? Is there is there a regimen? Uh, you know, is there a mantra? I should ask you that question. <laughs> You're the expert on this, uh, Shireen. On, a, on another show. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I would just say I, I love what I do, you know, and I, I like building products. And hopefully I've demonstrated uh, that I have uh, the ability to try and understand how products can have impact. Uh, as you know, I wanted to be a journalist. And so vicariously, I'm still in the journalism you industry. Are. You are. And I'm helping, you know, uh, the world communicate. But yes, you're certainly helping with storytelling. Yes. I think it's working with people. If there's a joy that I really get, it's working with people. You know, you talked about the, the fact that you're seeing such a fast pace of change and you, this is something that you haven't seen before uh, in the 25 years that you've been in the tech industry. What's also changed in terms of leadership? I mean, you know, you've got a situation in your backyard where we almost had a, had a caged fight which didn't come to. <laughs> what are you seeing in terms of changes in leadership styles and, and who's driving technology at this point in time and what's driving the aspiration at this point? I think leadership is changing. I've always said there are two things that leaders have to do. You have to help plant the flag, and if you have to help build the rope. Uh, but I think this notion of servant leadership, where it's sort of the inverted pyramid, and how do you really capitalize on the ingenuity and innovation of people? Because people have choices, and I think the pandemic reflected that even more. So I think most people are recognizing that leadership is about channeling, maybe it's about guiding, and it's less about, you know, dictating. And I think that's one of the things that 
at Adobe, we've always tried to do, which is great ideas come from everywhere. How do you channel those great ideas? Um, I think leadership's also about making decisions. And at times you have to make tough decisions that people don't want. And maybe that's something I've just got comfortable with. Uh, I'm not always going to be right. And so being comfortable with the fact that you're going to make wrong decisions, but then you move on and you wake up, uh, you know, I, I think those are the two things I've learned. So what's the, the big idea of 2023 that is still playing in your mind or something that you've already acted upon? I think we're so early with AI. I think you'll see us, you know, uh, have AI embedded in our products for the next six months. Uh, I was in the Noido office earlier this week and I saw some of the amazing things that are working on. So I think the world's going to be amazed by this. I think, you know, we tend to say it's over before it started. And so I think we're just getting started with AI. Shantan Narayan, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. It's been an absolute pleasure listening to your journey, but more importantly, uh, understanding what the road ahead looks like. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks for having me as always. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us as a part of CNBC TV 18. We heard your comments coming in from the panel discussion. Very interesting. Mr. Krishna compared it to catching a tiger by its tail. You compared it to a work of science fiction. AI is the turnaround agent that we're looking at. Just your thoughts on regulating AI, on having guardrails for AI. I think we'll need them. It has such potential to do so many good things for the world, and yet we need to be clear-eyed. Like any tool, some will turn it into a weapon. So we do need guardrails. I think it starts with tech companies in the private sector. It starts with self-regulation, but we will need new laws. We will need new regulations. We'll need it at the national level. Ultimately, we'll need it at the global level in terms of coordination as well. Uh, Mr. N. Chandra, while encapsulating the concerns, had uh, red flagged two issues. One, he said, will it take our jobs and will it affect our privacy? Uh, how do you look at these two uh, issues in when you look at generative AI? Well, I think we can take strong steps quickly on the privacy front. I think we'll need to 
think more and do more to really focus on the skills that people will need to really fill the jobs of the future. I think this will create more jobs, it, but it will change people's jobs. And in some cases, we may, seem, we may see certain categories where there are fewer jobs, but mostly I think we're going to see this impact people's work. It will make people more productive, but like everything else, including smartphones and computers, we'll need to learn new skills to get the most of it. And I think that's where we in the tech sector, that's where we at a company like Microsoft really need to lean in to help people acquire the skills that will be important. Just a final word on your visit here to India as a part of the B20 deliberations. Uh, we began the session with Mr. Chandra saying that India is poised for 7% growth for the next decade or so. Your quick thoughts on how the Indian market is playing out for you and what this B20 does in terms of catalyzing that energy. Well, the Indian market is extraordinary. It's extraordinary in part because I think India has moved so far this decade with its digital public infrastructure, with the adoption of technology. In some ways, there is no other country that has seen something quite like this. It's truly extraordinary. But the Indian market is also extraordinary because of the population, the youth of the population. We're obviously reaching a point where one out of every six human beings on planet Earth live in India. But more than that, one out of every four people of working age, say between 20 and 64, is here in India. I think more than ever, the world will depend on India. More than ever, India will be connected with the world. How are you looking at the challenges? We have a high inflation, low growth, uh, global headwinds. Uh, is that a concern for you when you're looking at your demand outlook, let's say, for the second half of 2023? Well, I think one always needs to look at the globe as a whole. One needs to always look at the opportunities as well as the challenges. But I think in some ways we've addressed some of the hardest challenges this decade has thrown at us. No one expected a pandemic. No one expected a war in Europe. No one expected the recession as sort of the pandemic bubble in some way burst. So I'm optimistic as we look to the future. There will be challenges, there always are. But I think in many ways, there's a lot of tailwinds also coming together. We wish you the very best and thank you so much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Thank you.